Welcome, everyone. So nice to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Travis Salwe. I'm an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University, and uh, I have the privilege of welcoming our guests and uh, welcoming all of you to this event. Uh, we are on unceded traditional lands of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, and uh, I'm feeling, uh, particularly this week, uh, coming up on Orange Shirt Day, uh, feeling a lot of gratitude um, for what we can learn reflecting on our roles uh, for myself as an uninvited guest and settler. Um, I'm, we're gonna talk today at today's event about uh, systems and uh, settings that unfortunately are still in a place where they are not prepared to uh, respond to the diversity that we see in gender and sexuality around us. And I'm reminded of something that Sarah Hunt has written about uh, the history of residential schools, uh, about how the strict divisions between boys and girls through European dress and hairstyles, as well as physically separating them in different dorms, was its own form of conversion practice. Um, and I'm inspired by uh, the teachings and leadership of two-spirit uh, elders, two-spirit leaders, who offer a very different framework, a way um, that I think offers uh, deep healing to indigenous people who are gender diverse. Uh, I'm going to make a few remarks uh, in terms of housekeeping, uh, and then uh, I'll go over uh, the agenda. I'll set the stage by explaining to you why we've invited uh, Florence and Jules here, and then we're going to have a conversation. So uh, I'll ask, please uh, do not take any photographs or videos or recordings during the event out of respect for the sensitive uh, information and stories that are being shared. Um, there are washrooms on every level of this building and there are gender neutral washrooms on the second floor. Um, and I wanna acknowledge uh, that everyone is coming to this event with different kinds of experience around healthcare uh, institutions, some of which have uh, treated us um, trans people, queer people, indigenous people uh, quite badly. And uh, I'm in part representing some of those institutions through my work in the public health care system. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that that makes it difficult to have some of these conversations, uh, but we're going to try to move forward and move through them um, as respectfully as possible. Um, so let me just say a big thank you at the start to the SFU Public Square team. So uh, Janet and Sakshi and Doug and Jeff and um, Mugasha, thank you all so very much. They've worked very hard to bring this event together. And I wanna thank our sponsors and funders, uh, in particular the SFU Faculty of uh, Health Sciences, the SFU Library, and uh, the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity. So we have a, uh, just under an hour and a half for our dialogue with Jules and Florence. Uh, I'm gonna facilitate a conversation between the three of us and while we're doing that, you may have questions that you'd like to ask and you'll find on your chair a card and a pen and I encourage you to write your question as it comes to you. And uh, at some point uh, throughout the conversation, I'll invite you to pass your cards to the outsides of the uh, aisles and uh, we'll have some volunteers collecting them and uh, have a chance to address some of your questions. And then once we've wrapped up, uh, we'll have some snacks and um, refreshments uh, over here. And we're joined by uh, UBC Press, the publisher for Florence's uh, recent book. And you're invited to buy an advanced paperback copy of Florence's book. Um, and uh, I think Florence might sign a few books if you're interested. So uh, let me set the stage for this event. In 2019, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau mandated that Attorney General Lametti and Minister Chagger prepare legislation to ban so-called conversion therapy. And this launched a two-year legislative roller coaster in which the federal government introduced three iterations of a law uh, that attempted to first define conversion therapy and then prohibit it. And I got involved because at the time I was working with some community partners on a survey that told us uh, a little bit about the prevalence of conversion practices among sexual minority men, uh, finding that tens of thousands of us had been exposed to these practices. And as I started to talk to more public health and university colleagues, to queer and trans community members uh, and cishet folks, I realized that there was a really narrow, popular con conception of conversion practices, one that 
followed pretty closely with the narratives that we would see represented in mainstream media um, and in cisgender queer context in particular. So I'm thinking of films like Boy Erased, uh, The Miseducation of Cameron Post, But I'm a Cheerleader. And by contrast, when I talked with survivors here in Canada who had gone through conversion practices, the true experiences of these practices was often quite different. Uh, one of the first survivors I spoke with was Erica Muse. Um, and she uh, came to Vancouver three years ago uh, to give a talk about her experiences uh, in conversion practices. And what happened with Erica is that in trying to access gender affirming care in Ontario years ago, she encountered a practitioner who denied her gender identity and subjected her to years of practices aiming to reinforce his concept of what her gender should be, a gender identity that aligned with uh, that which was assigned at birth. And uh, I'm very grateful to Erica for opening my eyes and um, helping me understand uh, a very different concept and definition of conversion practices. Following Erica's leadership, I began to meet other survivors, researchers, legal experts, including the two uh, incredible guests we have with us today. Throughout the legislative back and forth, and particularly during the December 2020 committee hearings, it became clear to me that unless we were very careful about the definition we were using, the federal legislation would respond primarily to matters of conversion practices that were defined by cisgender experiences. So focusing on a narrow notion of changing sexual orientation. And since the passage of the bill last December and the enactment of the ban earlier this year, I've started to doubt, um, maybe I doubt it already, uh, that the ban will do what is really needed to adequately protect against all forms of conversion practices, especially those affecting trans people. And so through the work that I've done with Erica, with Florence, with Jules, um, I've come to embrace a very different definition of conversion practices uh, than the one that's in the federal legislation. And I'm just gonna read uh, a bit from Florence's book. Um, uh, maybe I'm stealing your thunder. I don't know, Florence. Uh, so in, in Florence's book, which I highly encourage you to read, uh, they, they, they point out that r a very common problem in conversion uh, therapy legislation, not only the federal law here in Canada, but many of the laws that have been passed in the states and around the world, um, the, the, the people writing the law tend to focus on this concept of changing gender identity or changing sexual orientation, and this kind of misses the mark. So Florence writes, it may be more helpful to understand conversion practices not as an attempt to convert gender identity or sexual orientation, but rather to convert them into gender normative subjects, meaning the people who are being exposed to these practices. And because they, the practitioners, cast gender creativity as undesirable, trans conversion practices seek to promote identification with one sex assigned at birth and to discourage behaviors that are associated with a different sex assigned at birth. This is a very different concept of conversion practices than where we landed with the law, and I think we have a lot to learn from uh, Jules's and Florence's teachings and experiences. Um, Jules, you also published about your experiences in, uh, in the National Magazine Extra, in which you also reflected on how your own experiences with conversion practices started with um, gender non-normativity and the, the reaction of adults around you um, and practitioners around you to that. So with that, um, I'm, I'm really excited to welcome uh, our speakers. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about them and then invite them to join me up here on in front of you. So Florence uh, Ashley uh, is a trans feminine jurist and bioethicist currently completing a doctorate at the University of Toronto. Florence frequently contributes to public discussions around trans issues and served as the first openly trans feminine clerk at the Supreme Court of Canada. They are widely published in law and healthcare and are the author of Banning Transgender Conversion Practices, a legal and policy analysis uh, published by UBC Press. And Jules Sherrod is a photographer, author, journalist, and outspoken advocate for disability and trans rights. He has consulted on policy and legislation at multiple levels of government in regards to trans issues, has written about his personal experiences with conversion practices, and specifically advocated for improvements to legislative bans in order to encompass practices targeting trans people and identities. And Jules's cookbook, now I think the title has changed. You'll tell us the correct title later. Crip Up the Kitchen, Realistic Tips, Tricks, and Recipes for the Disabled Kitchen is due to be published by Touchwood Edition in spring of 2023. So we'll have you back then to talk about the cookbook. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Florence and Jules. And don't forget. 
forget to unmute. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for making the trip over. Uh, I want to start, just, I don't want to presume that everyone here has the same understanding of what we're talking about. So I want to start by hearing a little bit about what do you think, uh, maybe we can start with you, Florence, and then uh, get your reactions, Jules, but what do you think um, best describes for someone unfamiliar with this concept of conversion practices, what is it about? What, what kind of bucket would you put around it? Yeah, so it's, it's sort of, in part, I think, a fuzzy term in that it is really a spectrum that goes from um, sort of routine disaffirmations to really, on the far end, most like, systematic practices that really try to prevent somebody from being queer or trans or from socially living as a queer or trans. So uh, there are you know, many forms. Sometimes they try to change queer or like, you know, kind of who you are uh, and, and try to target you know, sexual orientation, gender identity, things like that. But sometimes they really go for the sort of like, uh, don't, you know, uh, like hate the sin, not the sinner, and will uh, tell you, well, you're, you're allowed to be gay or you're allowed to be trans privately, but you can't transition and you can't be in a relationship and you can't, uh, like, all of those things. And really where I think we get into the line of between disaffirmation and what I would call conversion practices proper is really when it starts being a systematic attempt. So when it's more than just the kind of occasional things and kind of unstructured approach, but when you really cross into the systematic aspect, which tends to occur in, uh, in setting with licensed professionals and with uh, faith leaders, uh, typically. Thanks, Florence. Jules, I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, what, what comes to mind for you. Would you add anything to Florence's definition? Um, I think the only thing I would add to Florence's definition is things that happen in the home when it comes to children who start presenting at a young age as gender nonconforming. Um, but when those practices, like there's, here, here's a thing that I like to talk about, is that it's cute that you're a tomboy until it's not. And there's this thing that, especially trans mask, go th through that here among cis women is like I was a tomboy but I, I outgrew it. There's a shame in once being a tomboy and this also happens with trans feminine but I'm going to speak to my experiences here because it's my experiences um, and so what happened it was a cute that I was a tomboy until I was supposed to have outgrown it and then I would get systemically punished at home for being masculine. I was forced to wear pink. I would get punished um, whenever I would do things that were masculine. My sister would get things that I wanted that were masculine while I was given things that were feminine purposely. So it's also that at home where a parent will go out of their way to punish a child for being who they are while, while giving like rewards to the other child like purposely the things that the gender non-conforming child wants. So that's kind of also how it happens at home. And then we'll find a therapist that will also like enforce that type of stuff and, and be like, yeah, you're on the right track and here are other things that you can do at home to force your child into their assigned role. Yeah, I mean, this is really on point and it reminds me of the work of the Kamich Clinic, which Erica went through. Uh, and there, they actually have a full-on kind of, they've theorized that approach. They call it intervention in a naturalistic environment, this idea that a lot of conversion practices, especially younger, is actually uh, coaching, like the, the practitioner is coaching parents into doing it to the kid. And there's 
a lot of data and narratives and, and stories by survivors, it really shows just how devastating that can be and how much worse it can be to the fact that it's coming from the parents, from the people that are supposed to love you. And I think it also goes to show, you know, the, the fuzziness of the line uh, as well, because, you know, well, is, is it really that different if the parents do it under the coaching or not? I mean, the result is going to be, is that time going to be extremely similar? Yeah, there's no, I mean, my experiences at home started long before it happened in a therapeutic set, setting when I was put in, when I was in um, foster care. So, and then it was, I, I divulged to my therapist that I identify as more masculine and it was like game over for me. And that's when, like for years and years and years, paid for by the province of British Columbia, I was subjected to some really horrible, horrible practices. I, in, in the piece that you wrote for Extra, you talked about how that practitioner had this misguided notion that your masculinity was rooted in some kind of trauma, which is something we, mm -hmm. we hear quite a lot about uh, in various forms of conversion practices. Uh, he insisted that you do a series of exercises, which really just intensified the distress for you. Where, where do you think we're at today in disabusing practitioners of that idea that if you could just somehow resolve that trauma, this would... So, leading up to this, it happens all the time. So a therapist or a, a, a social worker will read my article on Extra, and they will reach out to me in email and want to have a conversation so we can learn from each other about this, ignoring the fact that I also am formally educated in psychology. Um, so I was not only subject to it, but I was taught how to do it to other trans folks. And... Um, Leading up to this, so it was, what, three years ago, two years ago now, that all pediatric um, associations said, hey, we should stop doing this because it was the default. Um, we should stop doing this. But leading up to this, I had a, a person who was registered as a, ther like as a counselor and a social worker in British Columbia and other, practice, or other provinces reach out to me and admit that they do these, these practices and that um, they want to have a conversation with me to tell me why it's not actually bad and why it's helpful to their clients that they do this and they want to learn from me so they can do it in a way that's less traumatizing for their patients. And I didn't respond to them. But it's still one of those... Because <laughs> if you're not interested in having a conversation with me, um, no. But it's, I have that all the time. Therapists and, and social workers reach out to me wanting to have a conversation to tell me how it's actually not that harmful and, and um, how these practices can actually benefit people, um, despite the fact that it's not supposed to be happening, and knowing that there's nothing I can really do about it because I'm not the person who's experiencing it at their hands. It's, it's very brazen. They think, and they really think that they're doing something different or something. They think, oh, well, you know, this is not what people mean when they say convergent practices. This is literally the approach that was promoted by Joseph Nicolosi in his book, Reparative yeah. Therapy for Male Homosexual. Like, and, like, it doesn't get more core conversion practices than that, and there's the whole rebranding. Yeah, you know? and, the, and the, even their language on their website is, is, like screams conversion practices like they're like how exploring different ways that trauma could be leading to your gender dysphoria let's explore what is causing your gender dysphoria maybe if you just tried hard enough and it's not this but it, it works out to maybe you just need to try harder to be your, your assigned gender and be comfortable with it and maybe then your dysphoria let, like, let's treat your dysphoria and it's like you don't understand we have spent our whole entire lives trying to be our assigned genders and it is killing us it is literally killing us and do you not stop me from wanting to kill myself staying trans like I, I came out multiple times I detransitioned and then when I stopped being having suicidal ideation is when I came out and stayed out and that was it living in my living in my true gender was what solved my gender dysphoria what do, you, what do you think, so, you know, hearing that so much of this is coming up in the healthcare system, I mean, let, uh, if I were not as tuned in to the kinds of experiences you're talking about, I might look at what some healthcare leaders are saying in Canada 
well, we're moving toward better access to gender-affirming care. We're, we're following new guidelines to make sure that people you know, have improved access over previous years. We're, we're, we're making things better. Like, what's the relationship, do you think, between those improvements and the continuation of practitioners like the ones that are contacting Jules and saying, hey, I want to convince you that I have the way through this? Yeah, I mean, the, the matter of fact is, the more opinion changes and starts to go against conversion practices, the more pressure they will feel to rebrand themselves and find new ways of calling what they of, of calling what they do something else. So now, uh, in the U.S., there's reintegrative therapy uh, that is really emerging as this new kind of approach that looks indistinguishable from the earlier reparative therapy approach that was promoted. By by, uh, by much of the same people. And then for uh, trans people, there's uh, gender exploratory therapy that I published a recent, uh, an article about recently, which is the exact same idea, just about the gender, so this idea that like, oh, well, we need to explore the trauma, and I mean, but the whole idea is that being trans is automatically suspicious, and they essentially don't think anybody can be truly trans, and they just think everybody who is trans has trauma, and so they've kind of, uh, it's kind of presuming the uh, their, their own conclusion, but uh, I also think, you know, they've been doing that rebranding forever, right? It, it wasn't, even when it was very accepted to do conversion practices, they didn't, nobody ever called themselves conversion practices. Yeah, it was except called trauma therapy. Exactly. Uh, I mean, like, sometimes you get like yeah. Nicolosi, who is so brazen as to call it reparative therapy, but for the most part, like, nobody is like, yes, I'm doing conversion therapy. So that's a good segue into some of my questions about the federal ban. So if practitioners would not themselves label what they're doing as conversion therapy or even reparative therapy, um, what needs to be, you know, maybe Florence, you'll, you'll want to say something first because you've just written a book about it, but you know, what needs to be in that definition so that we can actually get to those practices. Yeah, I mean, there needs to be much more specificity. Uh, bonds have, have all been plagued by this very kind of fundamental uh, logistic problem. So this legal writing problem, which occurs everywhere in law, which is uh, it's deep point and bad approach. It's, it's like you're teaching a dog not to, you know, n not to do something. You like you point at something and you say bad, and suddenly people are supposed to stop doing it. And that's what the ban does, right? Like it, it says, oh, uh, changing uh, sexual orientation or preventing somebody from being trans. That's bad. Don't do that. But it doesn't actually delve into how people are justifying their practices, how they're conceptualizing their practices, what it means practically in terms of needlessly delaying people's transition, what it means in terms of you know always looking for the source of why they're trans or why they're gay. And so it doesn't go into those details and it also doesn't really think critically about, okay, well, saying no is cool, but laws don't enforce themselves, so how do we build the institutional uh, scaffolding that's necessary to actually discourage the practices? And a lot of that is just this, it's precisely the stuff that's not being done in, uh, in the laws. So that <laughs> and, and there's like provincially is where the government needs to stand up and if I hear the NDP government say one more time we don't pay for conversion practices I'm probably going to have my head explode and they do great because they do they do every single day for kids in care for for um for doctors denying um like not even referring a, a, their trans patients to a gender affirming doctor because there's a whole network of them that you can access through Transcare BC but there's lots of doctors that won't even like do that and because they're within their legal rights to deny any gender affirming care in BC um, they pay for it like there's still some services that are like um, social work services and therapies that are paid for by through MSP 
So the government does pay for it. They need to enact laws that have actual mechanisms for, like, where to report it, where the child doesn't have to go to a website and talk to a social worker who's doing it to them. Um, there needs to be a reporting mechanism that doesn't involve law enforcement because that's unsafe. There needs to be actual, um, because the province government is like, it's their job constitutionally to like do the enforcement. Like the gov federal government passes law, provincials are supposed to put in like, how are we supposed to do these mechanisms? And the government is like, well, it doesn't happen on our watch, so we don't need to do anything. And that's where, for me, is the big downfall because the government absolutely provincially has a role to play with us when it comes to enforcement and um, even um, uh, mechanisms to report a therapist to the different regulatory bodies where you get licensed, um, the College of Physicians, um, to universities where where it's being taught because it's still being taught in universities for um, social work students and psychology students. There's nowhere for people to go to say, hey, this is happening to me, um, and uh, what can I do about this? Like, nothing. Oh, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, uh, I'm, I'm always baffled by how naive governments are when they're saying, oh, it doesn't happen on our watch because I don't see it. And I'm like, well, have you looked? Uh, and the answer is always, well, no. And they're like, well, nobody, there's no billing code for conversion therapy. I'm like, yeah, nobody is billing it as conversion yeah. therapy. Come on. <laughs> there's a million other things you can bill it as, and no yeah. one's going to question it. Exactly. I, it, yeah, it seems like a lot of those pieces are missing. And I remember in the lead up to the federal government proposing and, and, and tweaking the legislation, um, there was conversation here in BC about yeah. a bill. And the response of many of the people from the government at the time was, no, no, this is a federal matter. This is yeah. to do with the federal yeah. government. But what you're talking about, Jules, is actually a multi-level um, strategy that yeah. says, yes, let's do what you're talking about, Florence, to like really clearly define this as wrong, incompatible with our values, but also has enforcement yeah. mechanisms. Yeah, and, yeah because it's without enforcement mechanisms, there's no point in having a law. Like It's just there for what yeah. you're addressing. Yeah. And it's also... I mean, again, like the silliness of them being like, well, but it's a federal thing. And I'm like, well, the feds, like, last year, well, I mean, then last year, uh, were saying that it's not a federal thing and it's a provincial thing. So can you, can you, you know, can you actually agree between, uh, between you and, like, I mean, the reality is that it's both levels of government, right? Because professional regulation and torts are within provincial jurisdiction. Everything kind of regulatory is largely within provincial jurisdiction. And then yeah. Feds have, uh, feds have criminal law and by extent some power over healthcare and public health through that. So, uh, you know, you gotta act on every level if you actually want stuff to happen. Because also, you know, uh, with a federal law, you're, you, it's a criminal law and when you've got a criminal law, you've got cops involved. Who wants, the, if you're queer and trans, you really want to go to the cops? I mean, I don't. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty high bar to actually go through all the steps you would need to bring about, a, a, to prosecute a oh, commercial practitioner. It's so difficult, because, I mean, you've got, of course, the presumption of innocence, but you need to establish proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And one of the things is the procedural aspect, which is really important. You can't force them to testify. You can't force the defendant to testify in a criminal case. In a civil case, you kind of can. Uh, so in a civil case, you've got all sorts of stuff that you can do procedurally and evidence-wise that you just cannot do in a criminal case. And in a criminal case also, you're not in charge, right? So in a civil case, yeah, in a civil case, if you're the one suing, and that is a lot of, a big burden to, to do the suing, but at least you're in control of the process. Um, you're not in a criminal trial. The Crown does whatever they want, and if they want to put people on the stand that's, that are going to be re-traumatized by it, they're going to do it. They're not going to care. Um, I mean, some might care, but I mean, I, let's say that uh, they don't have the best track record and a lot of those things. So, uh, I mean, and, and at some point, you, you know, let's, let's just hope that people don't end up re-traumatized by these proceedings. I mean, the reality is, not not to be too cynical, but 
Uh, I'm not expecting them to bring many charges under that law, if ever. I mean, uh, they're, they're, there's no, they don't really, I don't think they want to. Um, and I don't, I don't really just see that much room uh, for them to do so in practice because of how institutionally the criminal law is set up and how the incentives are set up and also the difficulty of proof in a criminal setting because, I mean, conversion practices are fundamentally about going to be like putting people on the stand with, uh, to testify in most of the cases. There's also the issue of educating judges. Because judges would have to make a decision because it basically will boil down to the word of the victim versus the word of the practitioner. And automatically, just because of balance of power, the practitioner is going to have more right. weight. And just because of how systemically, like historically, courts ha are not pro-trans. Like just, <laughs> it's only been the last three years or two years that lawyers have had the right to be gendered correctly in BC courts. So it's not like there's a big, huge pro-trans track record in the judicial system to begin right. with. So right. that's another barrier. Like It's it's yet another institution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've so my doctoral work is on uh, science and trans youth, and I'm not going to go too much into boring details, but one of the things that I found that was really like distressing was like there was one case not that long ago, like early 2000s, where a kid was essentially ordered into conversion therapy by the judge. Uh, you know, so it's not just like it's not just tolerance. Like the judges are very actively promoting that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, yeah, it was a, a little while ago, but you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there were much more recent cases that just didn't end up being published. So I, I want to go back to something you said earlier, Jules, to see if this gets us any closer to a useful definition um, that, that, that could be used in legislation. So when you were saying, OK, what ultimately, for you, relieved that distress and suicidality was just living your life in your yeah. gender identity, being yeah. trans. I, during the debates over Bill C-4, I heard some people say, well, could this be defined? Could we define conversion practices as those that are directed by the practitioner rather than the patient or the client. Yeah, so tell me what's what's wrong with that definition. So, I was, I, so here's, and this is compounded with being autistic and loving rules and tell, somebody tells me to do something and I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it 100%, 110% and I'm just gonna give her. <laughs> like, yes, give me the homework and give me the assignment and I'm gonna <laughs> ace it. And that's, they rely on that because a lot of trans people have, are also autistic. There's. It's, it's, just a, it's just a thing that happens. And um, so what happens is um, there's this thing called internalized transphobia that also gets weaponized against us, and so I hate using it, but it, we, we do internalize the messages. I thought I was fundamentally broken, and I would have done anything to be fixed because I, they, they were able to convince me that I was fundamentally broken and that every failure to be the good cis girl that they wanted to be was me character, like it was a character flaw. And the more I tried, the worse the dysphoria I get, which reinforced that I'm doing something wrong, which again, suicidal ideation, and it was just this horrible cycle of me, like hyper feminine, me like I'm going to ace this assignment, like, and it nearly killed me, like, multiple times. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have trigger warned that, but I guess that was already done beforehand. But, um, so it's like, I don't know, how about we just affirm people? Because, and if it doesn't sit right with you, they're also still going to have the dysphoria, and they're going to be like, right. okay, I'm just going to nope out of this too, and it's going to be fine. No harm, no foul. It doesn't hurt anybody to say, okay, how about you just try on this gender right. and see how it feels? Because you've already been trying on the cisgender for your whole entire life, and it feels crappy, so how about we try something else? Because, yeah, and we can't, like, I, I consented to the therapy because I wanted to not hate myself anymore. And I would have done anything to feel good in my body. Absolutely anything. And so that's, you just cannot, you cannot consent to it. You, yeah. you can't. Like, even beyond the you can't consent to torture part that yeah. I know you're going to say. <laughs> but we're not in, because society has convinced us that we are damaged goods. 
and that we hate ourselves so, so thoroughly that we cannot handle our bodies. If people didn't misgender me, I love my body, right? Like, it's, it's society who makes me feel crappy about mm. myself. And as, and as soon as I ignore society and says, screw you, I'm going to be me and I'm going to be fabulous, then I was happy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, so I, I, I will absolutely say that you can't consent to torture thing. Uh, but like, the first part of, of my comment on this is, well, what is the quality of that supposed consent, right? Because we know from research that people are not being told that one, it's conversion mm -hmm. therapy. They're not being told that what the risks are. They're not being told that actually all the evidence points against it. They're not being told that this is widely considered to be uh, just unacceptable by basically every professional association, uh, mostly in, the, in, like in Canada and the US, but also many uh, international organizations. So that's not being told. Um, and then who is the one consenting? A lot of the time it's the parents, not the kids. Uh, so there's a lot of questions around that. And then what are the pressures there? You know, How many people were told that they were getting disowned if they didn't go? How many people would, were threatened with rejection from their community, yeah. threatened I had with violence. It was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a condition of being in foster care. It was I had to go to therapy twice a week. I had no say over the matter whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and then the other point is, yeah, I mean, wh why should we care about consent in the first place? I mean, when, like, you know, consent matters a lot, but it's not the, like, it's not the metric for everything that is ethical and non-ethical. Like, consent is the first line, it's the bare minimum, <laughs> but then there's a whole lot of other, you know, of other stuff, you know, in, in Canadian law we don't allow people to consent to a wide variety of forms of harm. I mean, uh, for one, you know, just uh, a lot of like assault provisions, uh, uh, aggravated assault, things like that. Assault with a weapon. You can't you can't get out of jail free card because uh, somebody says uh, somebody you know consented. Uh, and then especially true with you know therapists and things like that. Therapists are, have a particular relationship where they are recognized as having a position of power by law. They have a fiduciary relationship to the person, which means that already the kind of the consent is is all bit put into questions in terms of quality of that consent. Which is among other things why they're not allowed to sleep with their uh, with their clients or patients. So you know we already already agree that uh, when you're somebody in that position of authority, consent does not license everything you can do. And more broadly, I mean, professional liability is based on whether it's considered an ethical practice by the professional body and under the existing science and things like that. Consent is part of that equation. But that's that's not what it turns on. There's a bunch of stuff that I mean, you can't uh, you can't have a doctor prescribing you know kind of like pseudoscientific uh, you know treatment on account that it's uh, that it's consensual. They'll still get their uh, they'll still lose their license over it because at the end of the day they have a job to do. They have that requires them to follow the science and follow human rights principles. And if they don't, then they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing, and the law gets to step in and uh, and correct that. If I can add something to that, that I thought about as you were as you were talking, when it comes to a therapist or a social worker um, situation. A lot of the times, that is the first person in the trans person's life that cares about them. And so they also have that added pressure to please the therapist be, and, and want to, like, somebody cares for me, so why would they want to hurt me? And so that also adds a level, like, of psychological mind F to the whole harm that happens in the head, because it's, a, it's, a, it's such an intimate relationship mm -hmm. with an added trust level and often the first time a 
trans person will be in a re where, where somebody, even if it's like somewhat, like there's still like professional barriers and stuff, it's still the first time that right. this person cares for me. So why would they want to hurt me? So, um, Florence, in, in setting up your book, you review examples of other legislation that and, and regulatory practices, or at least ideas, um, that have been used in different jurisdictions. I mean, is there any jurisdiction that you think is getting a little bit closer to what we need in terms of legislation or regulation of these practices? Um, yeah, so uh, there's the Australian one that I didn't get to talk about a whole lot in my book because it came out like when I was already like well to the uh, publication process so I didn't really get to do my like revisions to really adapt to that but uh, in Australia and I want to say it was the Australian state of Victoria the, there's a law that was really shaped like truly by survivors and it does you know is it perfect now but it, it goes above and beyond what a lot of, of existing laws have done, notably by trying to create a process that, that for enforcement through the uh, through their um, their kind of human rights commission and everything. So they do a, a, a much better job than other places. I still think it is a little bit stuck in that you know, point bad mm -hmm. uh, mentality, but it, uh, it did think a lot more deeply about enforcement and about how we actually get uh, conversion practices to stop. I think part of what has really been keeping people stuck in terms of legislation is that the first models that came out were the U.S. models. And the U.S. models are ex extremely conservative and risk averse because they're fighting against very hostile courts and they're afraid of mm. the uh, of the laws being struck down as unconstitutional by the courts which has I mean the courts have been mixed right like there's multiple circuits that have upheld the laws but then there's the fifth fifth Nine, I don't know, the, the Florida circuit, so the one where, like, you know, Florida, uh, where, where they said, no, that law is unconstitutional. So uh, the fear is understandable in the U.S. context, but then when people are copy-pasting that into, like, Canadian law, and you're like, well, in Canada, we don't have that weird free speech uh, you know, principle that basically defeats any, almost any law, no matter how good. So in Canada, there's no real question that this is a constitutional law, and so why are we, uh, you know, why are we taking cue from them? And uh, so I think, you know, that that's kind of been part of the problem. Um, before Victoria, Malta had done, you know, decent, uh, as far as comparatively decent, but I think, uh, I really think there is a lot of space for people to just like go back to the drawing table and start mm. rethinking like from the ground up. Yeah, I'd like to hear from you as well, Jules, like what could be done in BC, but before I ask for your thoughts, um, if I'm, 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 I do want to get questions from our audience, so if you haven't already had a chance, please uh, jot your question down and pass it to the outside aisles, and our volunteers will pick them up in maybe five minutes or so. Thanks. Um, yeah, what do you think, let's say um, someone is listening from, <laughs> from our provincial government, what would be um, you, you know, one or two kind of uh, legislation, regulatory mechanisms, like what actions would be at the top of your list um, that I think could take a measurable step toward toward removing some of these practices? Um, I think they need to... Gosh, this is hard, because it's not an easy <laughs> thing. But first, I think the first thing they need to do is actually sit down and listen and talk to survivors. Mm. And and like actually acknowledge that this happens under their watch and that they pay for it because until they acknowledge that nothing's going to happen and it's like 
with any problem, you first have to be able to acknowledge that's happening. And so that's an easy thing they can do. I mean, it's, it's people don't like to admit that they're wrong and, and apologize, but we're Canadian and we say sorry for the most ridiculous <laughs> thing. So it shouldn't be that difficult to be like, okay, we screwed up. Yeah. How can we make this better? I mean, it's the country of truth and reconciliation. Like, let's actually do some of this. Um, and then afterwards, I think it's like, I like, um, like, if the human rights tribunal could be the enforcement people, because I actually trust them. Mm. And they're really good when it comes to trans rights in BC. They have overwhelmingly, like, they've set precedent that other human, like, human rights courts in Canada use when it comes to cases for, for trans people. So if they, like, actually started, like, first spoke with survivors and then put enforcement to human rights and leave it out of the police and, and doctor, like, all that other stuff, and have a safe mechanism is hmm. two things they could probably do relatively quickly. And we might need to boost their funding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah. They're, yeah. they're a bit busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, my, you know, my answer is kind of two parts. So the first one is, I mean, if they like to copy-paste stuff, there's an entire chapter that has a model law in the book, so they can just do that. We have one we'd recommend uh, to them. Yeah. Uh, and then the second thing is, um, you know, not, not to give kudos to capitalism, but sometimes you just need to throw money at the problem. Yeah. And uh, the reality is, look, survivors need mental health services, survivors need peer support networks, need community organizations that have funding to do a lot of the groundwork towards uh, eliminating conversion practices. And that's not going to happen until organizations get the money they need to do that and there's been some headway with like uh, CT Survivors Connect in Ontario uh, which is really as far as I know first of its kind in Canada and if the funding was there I do think there would be a lot more room for community organizations by and for survivors to really start doing a lot of that work because honestly you know, being having been in the advocacy sphere, like I see how difficult it is for survivors to do this work and how re-traumatizing it can be and how much of a toll it takes even if people, you know, do it because they, they have to um, because of how important it is. But if there was, you know, resources that were there that would, I think, help people a lot in being able to do that work and I think that's kind of like the first step because you can have all of the laws in the world but if you don't have the people out there to do the to you know don't have the resources to do the work don't have the time to do the work then you know your laws aren't gonna amount to anything I want to acknowledge um, that from my own position as a, a cisgender queer researcher, when I started to look into this, the you know I referenced earlier these popular films and and even some of the survivors who've spoken out in North America, um, I, I I found that a lot of the people that I would talk to first or that people would point to first or that they would make assumptions about are cis gay men, and I think the more and more I've looked into this, so for instance, in some of the surveys that I've, I've worked on, I know you as well, Florence, we see um, overwhelmingly that, um, that trans people are disproportionately affected by these practices. And I think what I was trying to say in my opening remarks, and, and that I keep learning over and over again, and I think this is maybe there in your story a bit as well, Jules, is that when the roots of someone actually ending up in conversion practices starts to materialize, it's often at a young age, often in response to something to do with gender, quote unquote, nonconformity, and maybe by fixating on the experiences of um, cis, gay, and lesbian people in, in conversion practices, we've gone down the wrong path, and maybe there is something about 
what needs to be said or done with young people and how they're expressing their gender. Um, an, an affirming approach, an educational approach, I don't know, that would actually be more of a, my public health brain says, more of like an mm -hmm. upstream so, yeah, so route. If I can talk, speak to that, because there's like some of that happening in the SOGI um, education, yes. in, the, in the BC education like curriculum, but it needs to go beyond that. And this is like just anecdotal evidence, but it's still, Duncan is pretty typical when it comes to a mixed rural urban area. That's where I live, is in the Cowton Valley. And there's a doctor there who is the trans doctor for the valley. <laughs> like, they're the, they're the, 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 the GP. Um, and they came to, to trans medicine because their child is transgender. Um, and what they have found in their own practice is that every single person who had female on their original birth certificate who have come into their care has experienced conversion practices in the medical setting before them becoming their GP. And, um, and she's been trying to like get people to pay more attention to it. I have. And it's one of those things where um, the silence is killing trans youth and it's going to continue to um, kill trans youth as long as we continue to talk about this as something that only happens to gay men in religious settings instead of understanding that this is like the default up until the DSM-5 was if you if you were like I know people who work for the government who left the states for gender affirming care so they could escape conversion therapy in Canada because that was the default thing yeah. up until like five years and it still happens in a lot of defaults mm -hmm. yeah. but it was like institutionalized and you cannot undo that yeah. institution in less than it like it's but we need to I mean it needs to be again we like to say story we like to like we need to confront this head on and be like you know what I participated in this what can I do to be better and start unlearning my own transphobia so that I can be better and not subject another generation of youth where 60% of them want to kill themselves because society is so hostile towards them. Yeah. And there's... It, I, that's one thing I found the most puzzling when I started working uh, on around conversion practices is this idea that people have that somehow there's a, that like there's a neat separation between conversion practices that target sexual orientation and, and those practices that target gender identity and when you look at the history it's parts it becomes rapidly evident how just false that the economy is and, and thinking of um, Oliver Lovas and George Wreckers at UCLA Clinic who started a, kind of really popularized one of the major forms of conversion practices in the professional kind of licensed psychology world Oliver Lovas who also uh, invented uh, ABA uh, for autistic kids which is essentially autism yep. conversion practices is, um, and very vile person, but their goal was not to target sexual orientation or to target, no, they were tar targeting gender nonconformity in childhood because their reasoning was it might lead the kid to becoming gay or worse trans. So for them, there is this idea that gender nonconformity, basically being gay and being trans, were just extreme forms of gender nonconformity mm. in childhood. And if you didn't discourage it, then they would just you know evolve into being gay or trans. Which is not a new idea. This idea that being gay and being trans is just an extreme form of gender nonconformity is uh, essentially dates back to um, you know pre Freud. Uh, so really this the theory of like universal bisexuality and, and um, sexual inverts so now I'm going to go down into that uh, history rabbit hole but uh, you know this idea of like we're targeting the kid for being gender for, for being gender non-conforming is still true today and has been underpinning these approaches and weirdly to an extent like a lot of places where like oh well we're no longer doing conversion therapy because we don't try to prevent the kids from being gay anymore but they would take the same kids and subject them to the same practices which is that now they said it was because of uh, to change their uh, gender identity instead and you're like well I mean what's the difference yeah, and there's the whole 
trans panic happening with you're you're taking all of our lesbians and gay boys and trying to trans them and it was like no like first of all most trans men are gay like sixty yeah. percent of trans men are are bisexual or gay so you're, we're not you're not losing any lesbians number one I mean it's, it's just a switch like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like switching <laughs> yeah and I just I wrote, like, what's wrong with being a tomboy I'm like well let me tell you about how tomboy is a violent word like that yeah. alone like I they tried to make me a tomboy. Sorry, <laughs> like no, yeah. and like, and, and and there's like certain words that we need to lose from like if you're gender non-conforming, cool. I'm gender non-conforming, and I'm also gay, and I'm also trans, and all these things, and none of them have to do with each other. They're just yeah. separate aspects of who I am, and um, like let's let's let be let's kids be kids, and they'll figure it out before you are. Rec- er, Damage them forever <laughs> is. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned this about a- ABA because it yeah. seems to me that the common denominator is someone has some preconceived plan for how you are to behave, and and once you start to deviate from it, as you say, Jules, there's a period of time, maybe age related, where you're you're parents, guardians, teachers, whoever, are going to tolerate it, and then once it crosses a line, it's like, oh, now this has to be corrected. It was cool until I started school. And once I started school and had female peers, it was no longer okay for me to be a tomboy. That's yeah. when I was supposed to, once I had girlfriends in my life, that's when I was supposed to turn magically into a girl. Yeah. Which was also, historically, has accounted for much of the like um, age difference in references based on gender assigned at birth at yeah. the clinics. Um, kids assigned male at birth would come into the clinic much earlier because uh, femininity was seen as immediately al- uh, alarming, whereas it took until later for being more masculine to be seen as alarming because there's this gap where at first it's considered okay, but then you get to an age where like suddenly that's no longer okay. So we have lots of questions. Thank you all, and thank you, Sarah, for compiling these. Um, so the first question is, um, and uh, for for you being from out of province, I can uh, connect some dots. But much like the Sanyas Indigenous Cultural Safety Training, so this is a training that, particularly in the healthcare system, but now beyond, folks are encouraged to go through this to understand the history of uh, colonialism, residential schools, etc. Do you think the province and SFU? or other universities should offer gender identity training? Depends on who's doing it. (laughs) Who should do it? Trans people should be doing it. And not faculty members, because the faculty is still upholding these ideals and are still teaching it and I don't trust institutions like as much as you're all great and everything I still I don't trust SFU and UBC and UVic and all of them to, to do it and like even yeah I, it has to be outside of the institution that does it because I do not trust the institution yeah I mean I don't know enough about what that uh, what that sort of training looks like to, to really be able to comment. I do think there is an important place for education. Um, but, you know, education has been a centerpiece of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and just sort of like uh, inclusivity in, in large institutions since forever and what the data shows is that education is absolutely useless unless it also comes with uh, like accountability structures and enforcement structures um, so you know and I mean you've all seen it just, just, just think to the last like training workshop you did about some topic that they were going to do a 101 that you've already taken five times and that you just like didn't really particularly care about and they never go in, de- in depth enough for you to actually learn anything. Uh, these trainings don't work. That's not the kind of stuff that works. One thing that I do believe in as one small part of the solution is fix how it's being taught in the actual professional curriculum. Uh, one of the things I talked about in the book is the need to change professional culture as a really important part of that because providers aren't holding each other accountable right now. 
providers look at other providers and are like, nah, that looks a little bit like conversion practices, but hey, I don't really know what I'm talking about, so I'm going you know, to you know, let that slide and not bug them. And, uh, you know, um, the reality is like conversion practitioners, many are known and are still not ostracized by, uh, by their profession. Um, and, you know, there is a need to actually do that change, uh, you know, at, at kind of a deep level, but education by itself is not particularly useful. It needs, it needs to be education and. Thank you. So, uh, thinking about the difficulties in banning a practice, uh, this audience member wonders about switching to an articulation of affirmative rights. So, uh, they say, before its recent setback, the proposed Chilean constitution contained, for instance, neural rights, including cognitive liberty. Is, is a route like this promising? Is it possible in, uh, in Canada? And, and by the way, this person um, also, they know that Florida was formerly Fifth Circuit, now 11th. So you have a fellow, <laughs> a fellow legal person in the room. Uh, what, what, what about this notion of affirmative rights? Well, we kind of already have that, but it doesn't... Yeah, we kind of already have that, right? Like, it's in, the con it's in our charter, and it's still this convoluted mechanism where you have to, like, put in a rights case, and um, it's, again, without actual, like, policies and structures in place to, to enforce it without education, without, like, letting trans people, like, be able to identify what this looks like instead of, like, washing it over and calling it other things, it really doesn't m matter, because I, I have, like, I already have that, I mean, that's why we had C-16, right? It's And it's mm. just reaffirmed what's already in the charter, but just yeah. made it more, more, like, on the nose, but it still mm. hasn't changed anything yeah. in my life. Yeah, I mean, there's affirmative rights on paper and affirmative rights in practice, and I think a big question is which affirmative rights, right? Yeah. Because you can write a lot that says you have a right to your identity or something, which is in the Convention on Rights of the Child, among other places. Uh, but then people are going to debate what that means. And uh, people are not going to implement it because you're not telling them directly what to do. If you have affirmative rights that say you need to be able to access this, this, and that in this, this, and that way within, you know, this context and within this timeline, for instance, access to gender affirming care, if you have clear, like, clear metrics as to what you have a right to, in what context, under what conditions, then yeah, affirmative rights can be very valuable. But if the right is at a very abstract level, then it probably isn't going to work. It might still. There is, there is, you know, it's always that weird thing where, like, on occasion, some institution will decide that it's their pet project to deal, to, to kind of, like, make sure that the affirmative right is really implemented, and then you're just, but then it's, it's mostly that institution, really, that, uh, that is to credit much more than the affirmative right mm -hmm. itself. But for the most part, if it's not specific, then it, Problem. Like it's not going to work a lot because again, you need to go to court and who the hell has money to go to court? I sure don't. Um, the, we've talked a lot about uh, health professionals, practitioners, and what needs to be done in terms of regulating those actors, but what steps should be taken to improve um, parental attitudes? This person specifically mentions parental abuse against trans youth, uh, which Jules was referencing. Um, what, what needs to be done there? I say, again, it goes, so this is where, and this is like difficult for me because it was like also a social worker who put me in the situation that, that I was put in and they were there to protect me and put me in a home where I was free from the abuse. Um, but it, I, I think it comes more, like, more education needs to be done of teachers so that they can recognize it at school because they have a, a duty to report child abuse. Um, there needs to be education among judges because they're the ones who are going to preside over whether or not the, the, the parent was abusive under the criminal code because child abuse is a criminal offense. So there needs to be like a multi-pronged approach, education in schools for teachers, education of social workers to undo their learning, education of physicians, again it comes back to that, physicians in BC, some, I mean, 
they're they're allowed to to nope out of of, of doing gender affirming care, which is a problem in and of itself. Like that needs to also be undone. Like you, a doctor should not be allowed to deny you life saving medical treatment because that's what gender affirming care is: is life saving medical treatment. And yet, in BC, they can they can say nope, I'm not providing it, and they don't have to to. I mean, they're supposed to, but a lot of them don't refer to another physician mm -hmm. who will provide it. So yeah, it needs to come. It comes down to education to like even in GSAs and schools like having that as a place where kids and the the facilitator of the group can can um, like spot it and have those conversations because I worked with the GSA in Duncan and every single one of the trans youth in there was experiencing abuse at home and we had no mechanism to deal with what was happening at home and half the group were homeless because they came out for trans so and that's a big huge that's a problem and that problem is like happening all over Canada. So I'm like just one data point, but it is like there's even studies that show this. So it, it needs there needs to be more safeguards, and again, money. There needs to be money for for funding for safe places for trans youth to go when they are bu being abused at home. That's not necessarily the foster care system because the foster care system also is not friendly to trans youth in its current state. So that also needs to be overhauled. Yeah. I mean, you know, to make pancakes, you got to first invent the universe. Uh, and I think, you know, the, it's, a, it's a big question. How yeah. do you fix things? I mean, you got to fix culture. How do you fix culture? I mean, it sure doesn't want to get fixed, and it seems to be going right in the wrong direction, especially if we look at, like, Italy, uh, you know, like, electing uh, outright fascists to uh, government, and now, now we have to deal with poorly ever in Canada. So, uh, you know, culture doesn't seem to be going the right way. One thing I want to say about, you know, who needs to actually do something, well, first, we really need to get people to start caring about misinformation around trans people and gender affirming care for many reasons. The first one is because trans people are worth it, but I know that people don't care about that one, so I'm going to give the instrumental reason, which is uh, it's the pipeway to uh, it's a uh, it's it's a pipeline to the far right. You know, transphobia is the uh, is is how leading people right into the hand of, of fascists and neo-Nazis and, uh, and all sorts of extreme ideologies that we just don't want in, uh, in Canada or anywhere, really. And if you start addressing the hatred that's going towards trans people, it's actually going to help prevent... Uh, people from further radicalizing and who needs to do that well I mean the first people who need to actually start doing their job is the media companies who are doing who are pulling the weird both sides and stuff and are really selling uh, you know making their money off of the back of trans communities because you know all of these both sidism and, and anti-trans media pieces really get clicks and really make ad revenue. Yeah, there seems to be an entirely, I mean, not a new phenomenon, but like a new wave of sensationalist reporting around this. It's an this. industry. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I, 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 sometimes I wonder, and not just the federal debate, but municipal debates, every time we have a debate over conversion therapy, it seems to stir up these ideas and these comments and misinformation and people saying things like, well, isn't sending your child to a gender identity clinic a form of conversion therapy? So mm -hmm. how, how do we... How do we correct that misinformation consistently? Those of us who are um, who are cis, who are you know, who do care very much about the trans people in our lives and do believe that they're worth it. Like, what should we be doing um, to hold the media to account? I mean, if I had figured it out, <laughs> I mean, I think the big thing versus allies is because it seems like every single day recently there's a new op-ed that is anti-trans that is being published in Canadian media and mm -hmm. cis practitioners, doctors, social workers, therapists, they need to be practicing their own op-eds and being like, hey, this is the actual reality because mm -hmm. trans people can do that and have been doing it but nobody listens to us because we are not of sound enough mind to be able to make our own decisions according <laughs> to their logic. We are broken. No. <laughs> I mean, but that's like according to
inter- we're not we're, we're unreliable narrators is basically what society pins trans people as but there is trust in doctors and there's trust in and you're cis and it's better if you're white um, and you have that that automatic position of power and privilege above everybody else like we use your white supremacy to the advantage of, of trans people especially um, trans people of color who are getting it the worst yeah, I mean, mm. at some point, you know, editors' rooms just, like, they, they just got to start, you know, caring, um, because, you know, I mean, as you said, we send the op-eds all the time, and I mean, I've got, you know, I've got the credentials that look good to uh, to the editors and stuff like that, and they still, you know, say no, and... Uh, I'm most experienced with that in the Quebec context, but you know I know countless you know op-eds are getting rejected left and right whenever they try to be pro-trans. But the moment you want to publish something against trans people, well, mm. I mean, follow the money. Like it, it gets them clicks. It gets them money. Like the that's it's it purely economics, right? Like uh, editors, yeah, they have their biases. A lot of them are transphobic, but. At the end of the day, what it really comes down to is it makes them money. And so long as it makes them money, they're going to continue to push that hatred because they want the money. It's it's just as simple as that. So uh, this audience member... Uh, is asking, and maybe we can give people some 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 threads, some ideas to go away with. You know, are there any advocacy groups, regionally, provincially, nationally, uh, that we should be joining, following to support the fight against conversion practices, um, and in particular, survivor organizations? So you mm-hmm. mentioned CT Connects, but what, yeah. you know, No Conversion Canada. No yeah, Conversion Canada is a great um, organization to interface with. Community-Based Research Center is another great, um, Rainbow Refugee is another great um, organization. Stop stealing all of mine. <laughs> but, <sure. laughs> so those are the ones that, yeah, but you see, but the, I don't know, of course we're going to see, but those are the ones that are doing the most work right now in the gender, um, gender, what, what are they, they're sponsoring the, the Center for Gender yeah. and Sexual Health yes. Equity. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, other people doing good work, less, less, only conversion practices, but they've been doing some uh, work around that. Uh, like, just broadly, the Enchanted Network also. But, uh, mm. wi- 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 wisdom to action. Yes. Wisdom yeah. to action. Uh, see, I always just think about it as like phase, <laughs> phase organization, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, and I mean, for in terms of like support, like if you want to, you know, put money somewhere, like CT Survivors Connect is, is, you know, really, I think the people uh, who, really, you know, really need and, and deserve it and then at the advocacy level for the uh, kind of across Canada advocacy stuff I think like No Conversion Canada is really serving as kind of the center point of everything and everybody who does work around conversion practices connects through No Conversion Canada so they've really been kind of a central hub for that so yeah I want to so reiterate those because I mean a lot of those you said also connect back yeah. to to no conversion Canada. So yeah. So, so <clears throat> before we wrap up, I want to hear from both of you. Um, what, what what's next for you um, in, in the coming year? To um, something that you're really excited about that we can look forward to. Um, I don't know, maybe a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, May 9th, 2023, my cookbook, Crip Up the Kitchen, Tools, Tips, and Recipes for the Disabled Cook, is being published, and it'll be available wherever you want to buy your books, but I suggest or pre-ordering it through an uh, independent bookseller, because they're the awesomest, um, and it's basically what the title says, it's like the first front matter is all about how to organize your kitchen, things to buy, how to meal prep that is not ableist. Like the whole, I'm going to chop vegetables for a week in advance, huh? You know, that's going in the rubbish. (laughs) That's not going to happen because I'll be too tired. So, hey, how about if you only meal plan and cook three times a month? Does that sound good? So stuff like that. And then recipes, and the recipes are organized 
based off of spoons. So I hope our, if you're not familiar with the spoon theory, it's basically, so most people have cups of energy that they can spend, and it's really easy to refill those cups. Those of us who are chronically ill, we call ourselves spoonies, we have, if we're lucky, like three spoons a day, and it takes a lot more effort to refill our spoons. So all the recipes are organized based off of how many spoons it's going to cost you to make the recipe from least amount to the most amount. And it has um, dishes from all over the world so that people across different um, ethnic groups can like have their soul foods because it's really really important for health like mental health and physical health that you have culturally appropriate foods so I make sure that there's a wide range of culturally appropriate foods so, and they each teach a lesson so you can convert your own recipes um, to make them easy and there's also a lot of decolonizing of food in the cookbook as well where I tell you oh hey this this little bit of colonization is why we have this food or this so hmm. you get to learn about how white supremacy has also influenced um, food systems and f food insecurity as, as you learn to cook. I can't wait to try it out. <laughs> Influence. What do I have going on? Good. Uh, I mean, thankfully, hopefully not too much because there's so much going on all the time. I just wish there was a little less going on. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're at a law school and need to hire somebody, uh, I am <laughs> looking for a job um, <laughs> because hopefully I will be finishing my doctorate. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I guess I'll also have a book eventually, but it's not, it's not going to be until 2024 for my next book uh, on... Uh, tricking people into reading theory by sandwiching it in erotica. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Maybe it will help some of our students. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, I want to I wanna give you both a gift. So um, I'm, I'm really inspired by the work of SFU Public Square. And to the start off this academic year, um, they hosted an event with Angela Davis and Gina Dent on um, abolition feminism. And um, I think it was one of the most magical events uh, I've ever had the pleasure of attending, so thank you, Public Square. Second only to this one. Um, you don't have to pretend. No. I, but I, I think, you know, I sat there thinking, oh my God, like, um, because they just, they so beautifully articulated how we've got it wrong, uh, the, how the feminist movement has marginalized the voices of abolitionists and how the abolitionist movement has marginalized the voices of feminists, and there's another way forward. And what I learned from both of you is uh, the way forward has to be uh, intersectional coalition based and really getting back to some of these root principles around mm -hmm. what is it like to affirm people as they are in their lives early consistently and um, and we have a lot of work to do so consistent, I, I consistent cons so um, <laughs> I, I want to thank you both so much for making the trip here and spending time with us um, I want to um, invite folks to stay for popcorn I love popcorn and we have popcorn yes. and I think some coffee and tea uh, Florence's book is available here um, you can even use your credit card and Florence will sign it yeah. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Uh, thank you very much. Please join me in uh, one last round of applause for our guest, Julie.